Right, watch out, welcome back. Okay, now back to the booster build. It has been three videos in a row since I was doing the Harley Davidson engine service. I wanted to do those as long-term savings bank videos to be serving in 20 years time for people who want to service their old aged diner. Now, that's done, that's out the way, that's out on the road being ridden. I'm running everything in, and in the future, I'm gonna take it to a local dyno shop, and we're gonna have that, that wonderful s, s carburetor outfit properly tuned on a dyno. You can only do it by ear, you can only basically set it up so it's not too rich, not too lean and running okay, but it is ticking over and idling a little bit lumpy and that's purely because it's not fine tuned, but it will be. I wanna settle everything down, I wanna bed it all in, do about 500 miles on it, then I'll book it in and that will be a video you can enjoy it as well in the future. But for today, back to the Booster build. Now this is the mad and ridiculous project to turn an aged old generation one Hayabusa into our kind of rat rod, calf racer thing. <laughs> It's a ridiculous project, it's rather stupid, but it's going to be loads of fun and I'm going to use it as a learning curve, just like the Street Fighter build. I want to learn loads of stuff from it. And what I want to learn today, so for today's project, I'm going to attempt to face off a brake disc. Now, if you've never heard of that, it's the, it's the process of putting a disc in a lathe and machining the surface of it off when it's become too grooved and ridged to be of any more use. This particular disc is off the back of my old Kawasaki and it is heavily grooved and really badly worn and I think slightly warped possibly as well so it is trash I was going to use it for wall art or make a clock from it or something but I'm not I'm going to use it instead today as practice in the lathe to see if I have the skills or if I can even begin to try and develop the skills on how to face off a disc it's just a facing cut like any other but the, the challenge as far as I can see is going to be chucking it flat the lathe people will know what that means and I'll explain what I understand it to mean when I get near it. So that's in a minute, but very quickly before anything else, three big boxes on the bench. Let's show you what's in there. Right, okay. Let's put those two over there first of all. This is the first one. Now, you remember when I did the strip down on day two of the high booster build, I, I mentioned that the radiator is absolutely toast. It needs a new one. It's all bunged up the road debris. So this here, new radiator. Now this is similar to the one that I bought for the Street Fighter build. It's similar in the sense that it's for a different model. Obviously it's not the same radiator but it is nevertheless the same origin. It's a Chinese made copy of the original. Now no it wasn't silly money. I'm going to try and show you it close up. They're quite well wrapped. As you can see, now there it is. That is a copy of a genuine Suzuki Hayabusa radiator. Now obviously, the original would be about, as far as I'm aware, 750 pounds to buy a new one of these, and I can't afford that. This is not only a budget build, it's also a common sense thing. You don't go spending 700 quid on a bike that cost me barely three times that. So honestly, that's the best I'm gonna put on it. These are literally 69 pounds. That's all it cost me. But what I'll do is, nearer the time when I come to install this and change the coolant, which I'm gonna do as well, obviously, then I'll talk to you more about it, about the origin, and give you a link to it. But there we are, a replacement radiator, brand spanking new. I'm confident to fit this because I put one on the Street Fighter build, and so far, at 1,000, 1,200 miles it's done, it hasn't leaked, it hasn't caused a single problem, and it's cooling beautifully, and I think this will be exactly the same. They are a direct copy, they're incredibly well made. When you take the original one off, you'll see that all the fittings, fixtures, 
the clips, the brackets, everything on it is absolutely identical. That could be an original Suzuki one, all by the fact that it hasn't got Suzuki written on it. And at 700 quid versus 70 quid, I'm quite happy with that. So I'm gonna put that away safely and I'll show you what's in the other box. Okay, the second of the two boxes was this. Now, a very, very kind viewer, a gentleman by the name of Chris Munns. Thank you, Chris, stand up and take a bow, sir. Chris sent me this, it is a oil cooler for the Hayabusa. Now, obviously the radiator is in a terrible, dreadful state and definitely needs replacing. I was able to find one, a Chinese copy, at a tenth of the standard factory price, and I'm very happy with that, but not so much with an oil cooler. The oil cooler for the Suzuki was exactly the same ridiculous price, and there are no Chinese copy ones that I would trust, and I certainly couldn't find any anyway. So what Chris did was said, look, I've got one of these spare, would you like it, honestly? I love YouTube, thank you so much Chris. Stand up and take a bow again sir. That is fantastic and extremely generous of you. This is basically an Earl's style oil cooler, the sort of oil cooler you put on drag race bikes and so on. It's exactly the same volume, if not possibly a bit more, than the original Suzuki Hayabusa oil cooler and definitely an upgrade. If you ever fit in a turbo or any form of engine tuning on a Hayabusa, you always upgrade the oil cooler for obvious reasons. Now Chris tells me he's had this pressure tested so it's completely safe and also at the same time, He's included the hoses to go with it and I'm going to have to get some union changes and to make it so it can fit the Hayabusa because it's got metal hard pipes that bolt to a flanged union but I can get around that, that is no problem at all, fabricate some little brackets, fabricate some little unions and I can make this fit. Also it's going to have to have a little bracket fabricated to hold it, again loads more fun and games for the project, that's what this is all about. So again thank you so much Chris, stand up and take a bow, you're a gentleman indeed, I'm very very grateful for that, that's going to save me an awful lot of money, it was about £600 for the actual oil cooler I would have had to buy, the one that's there it isn't leaking but it isn't cooling much either all clogged up as before and this this is perfect thank you sir right finally the last box the big one right now the reason why i did the last three videos on the harley davidson engine service wasn't just because i wanted to do them part of the project and so on it was also because i was waiting waiting for this lot to turn up now you're no remoto i've used them a long long time now and they are just what you need for all the parts in one go. I went to their website when I first got the bike, video one. Remember when I did the lock set? I got the key, filler cap, ignition switch, the whole lot, fitted all that in one go. At the same time, I was shopping for everything else I needed. I went over the whole bike with a pen and a pad and got the whole thing listed. And that was the great list of parts that I've needed. Now, what they do, their simple policy is they take everything you need, they take it as a single order, they take what they have in stock and send it to you, and everything else that's not in stock, they put on back order and they'll send it to you in due course. And the postage, the shipping on the secondary stuff they have to send you, they don't have, that's completely free as well, which is really cool. But here so far, I have the bulk of it. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with a full list of everything I've got here. I'm just gonna quickly unbox all this, chuck it all over the table, and just run through some of the costs that I'm having to endure with this already. Let's get it all out first. Right, okay there we are, an only for parts here so far, and I've got a lot more to come. I ordered something like 60 parts in all for the project, went through it with a pen and pad, and this is what I think I need at this moment. Now, there's about 40 odd parts still to come. I mean, that's counting separate things like individual seals and individual bearings, but so far I've got this. I've got about a third of everything I've ordered, and that's, as I said, what Wimoto do. They'll send you what they have in one shipping price, and that's all you pay for, and after that, whatever is outstanding, on this list of stuff here, all that in red at the bottom is still to come. That's about two thirds of the order. That's gonna come shipping free. They won't charge for that. They'll just send it out when it comes into them in bits and bobs. And that's really cool because it means you can get on with the job. They know you're doing a project. They can work that out. They're sensible people. They're bikers themselves. They've all got bikes. They all work on their bikes and they know you need gear. So they've sent me everything they've got. Just to quickly hit over it, a Simota washable filter. I think a washable air filter is a no brainer, isn't it? Obviously, so that's that. Some slinky glide throttle cables. Now I'm going to replace both of them because they're kind of crunchy, it's not a nice feel. Also the tube and the grips, all that's being replaced and they'll come later, they're on the back order list. But so far, my slinky glide throttle cables are here. I've used those on uh, Penny's Triumph uh, and, and the Harley and, 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 and. Yeah, they love them, they're brilliant. Superb, and they are so smooth, they feel like they've been lubricated even when they're dry. 
Slinky Glide cables. Check them out if you haven't got them. Any of this stuff, if you've never tried Slinky Glide cables, they are about a third of the price of OEM cables. And in my personal opinion, they're better. They're a nicer slide, nicer glide, and as the name says, right. Next thing, brake pads. Three sets of brake pads. I'm using Brenta Sintered pads. Uh, I'm cutting the budget on this a little bit. I'm making this a budget build. I'm not going for the top of everything. I used EBC stuff in the past. The Brenta ones, absolutely fine. I'm sure you've seen them yourself, and I'm gonna use those for this build. They've saved me a lot of money over all of this by buying slightly cheaper items than the best there is all the time. Same goes for the chain and sprockets. Now the chain is on the back order list too. I'm getting a heavy duty X-ring chain. It is a Hayabusa. And I've got these JT sprockets. Now I think we know that JT are just probably about the best sprockets there are. Uh, you might have an opinion. <laughs> this is what I believe. Uh, but there we are. There's a rear sprocket, just a standard plain silver one. Don't need anything fancy. But the front one, what I love about these JT sprockets is that, I'll show you, you get this OEM style rubber damper on it, which kind of, why not, you should do. It's not just a cut sprocket. There it is. And I'm just gonna bring this over, you can see, you get this going on, very much like your original sprocket. So there we are, that's gonna definitely be a little upgrade, because I need a chain of sprockets. It's not completely worn out, I just don't want to end up with a finished custom bike, and then have a chain of sprockets to do six months later. So that's that done. Um, Let's go over the bearings as well. Right, I've got a set of front wheel bearings. That's gonna be the next video after this. A set of rear wheel bearings. That's easy, that's all three. That's gonna take the back off. That's when you put the sprockets on, do all that sort of thing at the same time. Now this little lot I love. This is a rebuild kit for the short link. You know, underneath the swing arm, at the bottom of your suspension leg, you've got the suspension triangular link underneath there. There's two sort of spacer sleeve tubes in there. And I'll show you this, absolutely loads of these little needle roller bearings. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. So they're all getting replaced. They all come in one kit like that. Interestingly enough, these tubes, these spacer tubes that go through, they're genuine Suzuki ones. Obviously not available in pattern, so Wimoto just buy them and put them in. I imagine that's at a cost to them because buying any parts from Suzuki, you're not gonna get a deal just because you're a trade supplier. So there we are, that's the full kit to replenish and replace and restore my short link suspension linkage underneath. That's a really good one. I have greased them up and cleaned them in the past, but I haven't done a full rebuild, so that's a video to come. Each of these are gonna be videos to come, which is why this project's gonna be so much fun. Now, all this lot over here, this is the brake rebuild setup. Now, these Tokiko six pot calipers, they are seriously maligned. So many of you think they're just rubbish and they should be heaved into a skip. Honestly, my ones work absolutely fine. Some don't, I know, and when you try and rebuild them, they can be a problem. The reason is because the pistons in them corrode badly. They're made of reasonably low quality stainless and they do corrode, and once they're corroded, well, you're only ever gonna prolong the inevitable, which is that you leave them in a skip. But for these, I'm gonna do something I didn't know was available. I checked this with Remoto. I said, can you get the individual pistons as well as the seal kit for rebuilding? They said, they come in the kit. Check this out. So this is a rebuild kit. I'm gonna come over there. Right, you get the two seals, dust seal and main seal, and the piston. They actually send you a stainless piston in each rebuild kit. This is a six pot, so you get six of these per caliper. And this is the cutest thing ever. A little tiny pot of rubber grease, all included, a little screw pot. That's what you get as one kit. And I bought 12, because it's a pair of six pots. Cool, eh? So with 11 here so far, that's just a different box. So there's 11 piston and seal kits for the front, one to come on the red list, and two piston and seal kits for the rear caliper, because I'm gonna do the same with that. And once again, you get a big piston for the rear, you get two of them, and some red rubber grease and the seals as well. So obviously this, with a piston included, is more money, and that's where a bit of the money's gone on this. Uh, this whole lot, all of this lot has been seriously expensive to buy. Some of it's quite a lot of money. Those Tokiko calipers are over a thousand pounds for a pair if you buy them from Suzuki. Now, okay, you can buy refurbished ones, but how far is that gonna go? How much does any six pot caliper cost of any standing? A Tokiko is pretty good quality. If you buy Nissin four pots, I know loads of you said that, and yes, if you remember the Street Fighter project, I had Nissin four pots from a late model Bandit, but they just came with the bike. I didn't buy them. I wouldn't about to go out and buy those. They're lots of money. So rather than pay a grand for tuning calipers, 
These ones are a little bit sticky and dirty, but they're all working okay. However, with that lot, I hope to refurbish them for years to come, no issues. But that lot, 214 pounds. Now, that could be as much as a tenth of the actual price of replacing the calipers. So when I get them, I'm gonna rip them apart down to the bare castings alone. Clean those out, and if they are good, if they are good, I'm going to rebuild them with all these and I should have some perfect Takiko 6 watt calipers which will definitely do the job to stop this big old coach going up the road. And I'm happy with that. Now whether that works or not, we shall see. This is going to be a journey. This bike, this project like the Street Fighter build is a journey. I hope to learn a lot from it. So much more stuff to come. Chain itself, the list is endless. There's loads of gear to come. The throttle tubes, uh, the suspension itself. I've got, uh, I'm not replacing the discs. I've got those wavy Galfer discs on the front and they're in lovely order. That's, Sometimes with any project, you inherit something quite nice. So th thanks to the last owner, I've got some cool front discs, but the rear disc, I haven't. The rear disc on this is absolutely trashed. Probably why they replaced the fronts, because they generally wear out first, and now it's time for the rear. The rear's got loads and loads of grooves in it, but one thing I have found out is that it's the same PCD, that's the stud pattern, as this, which is my Kawasaki disc, as I just said. So this is the project today. The first project, day three of CAF Booster Build, to see if I can refurbish this old Kawasaki disc to fit in place of my Suzuki one. And if I can't, then I'm going to have to buy one. So wish me luck. Let's clear all this up, set up the lathe, and have a go. Okay, clean, clean, clean. Right, I just want to say one thing about these machines, about cleanliness. I don't really want to say anything about machining because I am not worthy. I know nothing about this. I'm learning as I go. I got this machine at the beginning of the year and I've been learning ever since, so I'm not worthy to say what you're supposed to do. I know a lot of you are asking that, but all I can say respectfully and humbly, don't ask me. Watch, if I do it and it works, then that's how it worked for me on that day. But please follow the machinist. Now, I've got some great friends that I've made in the machining community. Uh, Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy O'Charlie and Huey, thank you guys, you're the guys who sent me the bar ends, material and tools, you're so generous, thank you for that, I really appreciate it and I've been astonished by the welcome and the generosity of the machining community but it's the channels I want to quickly talk about, if you want to know about machining, I follow people like uh, Mike at uh, ebomb79, who doesn't, uh, Chris at Clickspring, oh my goodness, who wouldn't watch that and be fascinated by it, the guy's a genius, and of course people like Joe Pye, who is an amazing teacher. So get online and check these people out, they are amazing and I'm learning so much from them. And I just want to say one thing that I have learnt, and impart that at the very least, and that's not about machinery or anything, it's just about cleanliness. The one thing I see in all those guys' channels is their machines are always spotless before and after the operation and often during. You'll see them do a turning operation, dwarf chips everywhere. You'll see them put another piece of metal in and do something else and the machine's spotless again. I think that's a given, it really should be. These slideways must be lubricated and clean but dry when you're using them and so on. Otherwise you can scratch them and damage them and so on. So I'm learning that as I go. Cleanliness is a really important thing. This garage is full of all manner of stuff. I'm grinding and cutting and welding and sanding and all sorts of things in here and that makes dust and grit and all sorts of things and that settles on the machine. So I clean it before I use it, not as well as after. Both times are very important. And yes, I know I should get Nana to knit me a cover to go over it and I will deal with that too. And yes, also I know I should deal with dust extraction. Well, I am. So watch this space. Proper dust extraction system is coming. I'm working on it now behind the scenes. I haven't got anything for you yet, but when I have, it's gonna be seriously impressive and a proper way to do it. But I'll deal with that another time. For today, I'm gonna to bung this in the lathe, see if I can chuck it straight so it doesn't wobble, and see if I can face that off, take some of the grooves out of it and repair it. If not, then it's another piece of wall art, and if I can, then I've got a disc for free. So wish me luck. First job is take your jumper off. And I know you're always nagging me with that one, so sorry. There we go, sleeves out of the way. Right, now I've got to get it in the chuck uh, flat, so you can go over the jaws 
and then undo the jaws to grip it on the inside. See if that works. Let's show you this. That's rubbish. There you go, watch. Boing, boing, boing. I think we'll see how far that is out that way. It's kind of oscillating, so if you machine that across, it's going to be cockeyed and it'll just be trash. So I've got to get that flat so it absolutely spins dead flat. Now it's up against the chuck. The first thing that seems obvious is that the back of the disc is dirty. There's all sorts of corrosion and dirt on there, and I guess that's going to hold it off so it doesn't sit flat against these bases. So let's get that cleaned off at the back. I'll use a scotch bright disc, a fine one, just to clean dirt off and not take any metal off, because again, that will trash it as well. It's pretty hard steel, stainless, it should be okay. So let's get the back cleaned up first and see if that helps. Keep the sanding grit off it. All right, here we go. These are a, a, a flat disc with scotch bright on them, kind of hard version of it. They come in different grades, that one. three different grades, um, what have we got, the red one is medium, this brownie cream one is chubby brown, that's coarse, and that one is fine, I think that will do it, use that one. Right, okay, half an hour later now to let dust settle, door open, airline blew out, so no dust from that settles on that, learning as we go. Okay, and I didn't take any metal off. Before I get flamed for putting a grinder on the back of the disc and then buggering up the flatness of it, I didn't touch it. If you look on the back closely, I don't know if you can see it in the lathe, but there is a cross hatching in the surface and it's still there, albeit just clean now. You can probably see it kind of just here. So that indicates that all I've done is rub the dirt off and shine it up, and the same goes for the front. The cross hatching from the manufacturing process is still there, so I haven't taken any metal away. All I've done is clean all the corrosion and rubbish off, and hopefully that will chuck flat now. What should we see? on it and see how far out that is. Right, that's currently got a run out of 50 thou. That's just all over the place. Right, let's try bumping it. There we go, five. Get it down to about eight, I think. That run there, it's just a lump from there. Starts there. Finishes there. So we seem to have about one third of the disc. He's looking out, I wonder if it's warped. Didn't feel it when I rode it. Eight thou run out there. And then bumping it. There's the highest point there. Just take that out of the way. Just very gently. the difference. Right, a whole hour of messing about with this and I found out what's wrong. The reason it won't chuck straight is the disc is warped, which is interesting. This was the disc off the back of the ZX7R. Now, I rode it once back from the place I got it. It was on the bench for two and a half, two, two years and nine months. Uh, as soon as I got it back, I took that disc off. So I don't remember three years ago for the once I rode the bike whether this actually was oscillating on the pedal or not. It could well have been, but one way or another, this disc is warped, because when I put the dial gauge on the inner, right near on the chuck, it's only got three thou of run out, which is possibly the metal thickness, who knows, but that is it. And that's acceptable. So 
the point that I'm clamping it on the chuck is flat. The outer part of the disc is still 30 thou out. Now, I'm going to machine it down because obviously if it's a warp disc, it's scrap anyway. And I'm going to see if I can get it flat both sides. And when I've done that, I'm going to measure the thickness. It can't be any thinner than 3.3 mil, I believe, for this bike. If that's the case, if it's any thinner than 3.3 mil, it's still scrap. But I've got to take off the, the ridges and the fact that it's warped. If it's thicker than 3.3 mil and it's flat, I have a disc I can use. Save yourself 100 pounds. I like that. And there we are now, turning that with the dial gauge on this central part. That is only 5 thou out, which for a brake disc, I don't know, that's probably still too much. But it's a lot less than it is on the outside where it's nearly 30 thou out, 35 thou, which is too much. So clearly that's a bit of a twisted disc. So let's face it off. Let's run a tool across it and see how it looks. And now this is a very small lathe, so challenges, ever challenges. Next thing that's popped up is that this is quite a big disc by comparison to the size of the lathe. If this was a good big machine, then it would go in there and I'd be able to cut from the outside in in the normal way, which is correct. But because this is such a little machine, I can't bring the cross slide out any further than this edge, which is about eight mil beyond the edge of the disc. So I can cut from the inside all the way off with an outward facing tool. I can't cut from the outside in because if I put an inward facing tool in the post, or if I spin it round to face inwards like that, I'm about 10 mil from the outside edge. So I can't get out far enough on the cross slide. It comes out and stops there. So my cross slide would need to come out about another 12 mil, then I could cut inwards as normal. But I can cut outwards. If I use an outward facing tool like that, I can cut from the inside out. That wouldn't work if I was trying to go all the way into the middle. It wouldn't work because I couldn't start in the middle. You have to have a hole in the center or something. And I have. I'm only cutting this outside inch here. It's got a step anyway that I can touch off and come on out nicely. So that should work. So if the machinists out there are now heaving a great big sigh of, oh my God, let me know what am I doing right or wrong. But I should be able to face that off by coming outwards. And that's purely the limitations of the machine that's giving me that problem. I would normally go inwards before I get flamed. So let's do it. Right, as you can hear, that's clanging away like a bell. Um, it's obviously hard steel. And it rings a lot, so I'm going to slow it right down. I think it's running a bit too fast. It's an interrupted cut as it's oscillating, so it's kind of dang, dang, dang against the tool, which isn't going to treat it very well. So I'm going to slow it right down and bring a bit of coolant in and see if that helps. Right, see so what that looks like. That's better. And yeah, of course I'd love a lathe. I could chuck a lever or press a button and slow the speed down or speed it up, but I don't have one. I have this one. Maybe next time. Right, okay, learning as I go here, that kind of herringbone pattern that you see in between the little holes, the vent holes in the disc, that's chatter where the disc is literally shaking. As the tool is dead still and rock solid, the disc being obviously unsupported out here at its extremity, when these little holes are hitting the cutting tool, they're just bouncing off it. So it's causing that chatter, the whole piece, the whole disc is just chattering backs and forwards. When I'm at the inner edge, where there's no holes, and this outer edge where there's no holes, I'm getting a beautiful smooth cut all the way, a lovely chip coming off it, perfect. But where the holes are, it's just chattering all over the place, because this is hard. These discs are incredibly hard steel. I'm going as slow as I can at 160 revs per minute. Um, don't know what speed that is by the time it gets out to here, but obviously this far out from the central point, that's quite fast still. It's probably still the same equivalent to about five or 600 
at the centre if you're turning a bar. Now, because of my complete lack of knowledge of machining, I don't know how to remedy that. I have a firm belief now that this disc is scrap because as much as I'm able to cut it, as much as I'm able to cut it flat, that chatter is unacceptable. It would chew brake pads to pieces. The only thing you might do is ghetto it with a grinder, and I'm just not going to do that. I want to try and machine this if I can. Um, so I'm going to swap the, 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 the belts over again and speed this back up to say 600, which will give this some serious speed at the top, and just very tentatively touch a cut on it to see if that eliminates the chatter. It could be the fact that it's going so slow, it's just banging around and vibrating. I don't know, but this is a proper learning experience for me. I'm literally feeling my way, and I appreciate any insight from you machinists like Jimmy, people like yourself, whatever you think is going to remedy this, other than a Gert big machine that holds this disc properly. It could be the disc just needs to be held in a proper machine. Perhaps, to be quite honest, the disc just needs to be put in a mill, a milled flat. But I haven't got a mill, I've got a cheap lathe. Right, right, okay, that speeded the RPM up to 400 instead of 160, so that's turning a lot quicker now. To take one more pass or attempt to take a pass and see if it cuts smoothly. This, as I said, I'm learning as I go. Sometimes you need to cut faster, sometimes you need to cut slower. Uh, I've got a nice sharp tool in there. I'm just going to see if I can bring one more cut along there. And it's when it gets to these holes that it's obviously the vibration that's being caused is causing this noise in the surface, and you're getting this herringbone pattern or herringbone pattern in the surface of the disc, which won't do. That's not acceptable, and that will trash it. So I'm going to take one more pass. And then, if it doesn't work, I think we'll retire this and call it a defeat. But let's see. Wish me luck. No. That's definitely not right. Okay. Sadly, it looks like I'm going to have to admit defeat on this one. The outer edge of it is literally vibrating, and I think that's what the problem is that's causing that, which is why it's a fail. I've got it flat, as you can see. There's no dark patches around it. I've gone all the way around. I've actually got it completely flat, but it's not going to get smooth. And that, all those patterns around there, all that rough, that's horribly rough, that is, as well. That would just chew pads to pieces, and it wouldn't work. Not at all. And I love learning stuff like this. But that's going to be a wall clock. I'm going to put a nice clock in the middle, a little Delboy's Garage clock, put it up there somewhere and that will be another lesson learned. Right, I'm going to get cleared up, and we'll do the board and call it done. Now the next video is going to be the front wheel bearings. You see I've got them, I've got loads of stuff in there, so front wheel bearings, ever so easy, one either side, pop them out, slap a new set in, extremely easy. I'm not going to make it an in-depth, detailed video like the last one. I don't have Penny Pit Stop here, to do it for filming all that sort of thing tomorrow. She's gonna to be working tomorrow, so I'm gonna do that video tomorrow, which is Saturday at real time, because this is Friday at real time. You're watching this in the evening. This is now 2 p.m. Obviously, because of my day job this week, I ran out of time and I've had to film and edit and bang all this up in one day. So if this is up a little bit late in the evening, I'm sorry about that, but this is about as live as it gets at the moment on this channel. After this, like I said, tomorrow, Saturday, I'm gonna record the footage for doing the front wheel bearings, get that done for you, and that'll be the video for midweek. So there we are. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate all your amazing support. This was day three. I'm gonna update the board, take it easy, ride safe. I'll see you next time.